Yeah, stoked to be here, actually. So this is a talk about what everyone should know about REST, but in a sense, it's also my obligation to explain why everyone should know about REST. And uh, as soon as this wants to let me go ahead, I'm going to do that. Uh, let's see. Might have to be standing by the lectern. Uh, yep. OK, that's cool. So a little bit about me that John just covered. Um, I did study at Melbourne. I sort of had a traditional server background and also interested in UX. So when Ajax came on the scene around 2005, that was pretty fascinating to me because um, it was really the ability to deliver rich experiences to users in the browser. People were already using the browser because of all of the convenience factor and zero admin and so on. But it was actually when Ajax came in that we could really get the most out of it. And so really, I got into that in a big way. I wrote this book, Ajax Design Patterns, and worked at BT, uh, a group called Osmosoft. And uh, also, I ended up working on the Chrome team. And that's really where I drank the Kool-Aid, working with all these external developers, and decided to go back to the roots, uh, back to my roots in startup world, and actually work on this product, Player FM. So it's a podcast app. It's kind of an aggregator to let you look at different topics uh, rather than just sort of micromanaging subscriptions. It started as a traditional website, but it was developed responsively. And it also was developed you know, so that it would work reasonably well on a mobile, in a mobile browser. So it's been an interesting experience because, as John mentioned, it's, it's web uh, on the one side, but also now it's a native product as well. And what they do actually have in common is the idea that, like all these connected products we have today, that they are actually taking advantage of web services. Uh, if you're writing a website, then by definition, it's using the standards, the protocols of the web. It, but if, you know, that's a sort of traditional website. And of course, these days, we're writing single page apps as well. And that's where we're making Ajax calls back and forth to the server. And that's where we're really treating the server as an API. So it's really a kind of computer to computer messaging interaction. And that's actually the same. So even though we don't think of native as being something that's very web-based, in fact, when you create a, a native app, you're heavily taking advantage of the web in terms of the things that you're polling to get data across from the rest of the world. So Google Glass is another example of, of a, a REST API. They released their Mirror API. And it just shows that something so sci-fi and exotic as glass is still able to take advantage of this core technology. It's really about this concept of the Internet of Things. We have all these different connected devices today. We used to joke about the idea of the Internet-enabled fridge. And now it's very much becoming a reality. And we talk about you know, Internet-enabled air conditioning, Internet-enabled wearable fuel bands and all sorts of things like this. This is com computers and devices talking to each other. And the, if this was five years ago or 10 years ago, maybe, we'd be having a big debate about what the protocol is for these things to talk about, to talk to each other over. If it was 20 years ago, we, it wouldn't really even be maybe even internet TCP IP protocols. But as, the, as these standards have evolved, the web has really sort of won this debate, almost to the point where I don't really need to argue why would you use REST for these things to talk to each other versus something like SOAP or WSDL. Uh, that battle has sort of been won at this stage. This is Tim Berners-Lee uh, at the Olympics actually demonstrating the original Next Cube that he created the web on. And what's interesting about this is for those of us who were using computers in the early 90s, probably not many of us were using Next Cubes. There are lots of different types of devices available. There were Macs and Windows PCs and Unix devices. Um, not too long after that, we had WAP and funny ways of getting onto the internet, apart from devices, Palm Pilots, whatever. So the web has always had this, this uh, principle of working on all of these different devices. So if it seems funny today that something like glass can come along that Tim Berners-Lee never had to consider when he was coming up with these standards, it's because the web always had that culture in place of, of embracing openness and embracing all of these different devices and operating systems. So I'm going to cover today really, I think, three principles for actually making a REST API. And it's relevant whether you're on the client side consuming it. Maybe you're writing single page web apps or mobile native apps or 
uh, just you know, embedded devices, or you're on the server side. You're actually, you've got interesting data, you've got interesting sensors, you've got content sitting there that you want to expose to the rest of the world and let all of those great apps that touch users take advantage of your content and your services. So whether you're doing client work or server work or both, these principles uh, will help you to, to sort of understand how to make the most of the, the standards of the web uh, that are getting more and more um, prominent and will actually help you to be more efficient when you start to deal with infrastructure that goes across the whole internet, things like proxies and browsers and servers. The principles are don't make me think. So the first idea is, is basically just really designing web services to be simple and intuitive. Second is to lock things down, right? So basically, um, once you've got your, your basic services in place, you'll start to look more at who can actually access what things. And then the third stage is what I'm calling turbo mode. It's basically uh, optimizing, you know, making users happy by delivering fast content to them. And also, as you go even further down the line and you put, start to put things out in production, which is, I, I actually did this week and it's been an interesting experience on this front, scalability starts to become a really serious issue. So the first part is really don't make me think. Uh, the term, you might be familiar with this book, uh, Steve Krug's book, Don't Make Me Think. And I'm talking here about user experience. And why am I talking about user experience in a developer conference? It's because I think it's very important to consider developers as users. And I coined this term a few years ago, developer experience. Uh, the logo here is actually taken from a South by Southwest panel that they did on this topic. And it's starting to gain a bit more prominence, the idea of, of actually looking at developers in a more holistic way. So we've always had these kind of principles of encapsulation and modularity and high cohesion, all this business. This is trying to take things a little bit of a step further. And the same way you might look at how um, someone opens up an iPhone on day one, the unboxing experience, do they feel this emotional attachment to it? And the effort that someone like Apple puts into that whole experience, you know, they're thinking about what do they actually see the moment they open it. They make sure that the battery's charged so it's ready to go. They make sure that it's a smooth experience when the user turns it on that we should be thinking about APIs the same way. And so not just about the technical design and making sure that it's you know, reliable and resilient and all this, but also making sure that it's really in intuitive and that something that users or de developers in this case find a joy to use your APIs. The first step really with REST and with API design is to come up with URI schemes, you know, just nice, clean, simple, restful URI. So this is what I would call a cool URI. That's probably a less cool URI. Um, and, and we've all seen this, and we've seen ASPX dot something and uh, you know, random hashes. And, and, and probably the biggest sin with APIs is actually making them uh, do perform actions. Because with REST, there's this convention that we're actually identifying things. That's what a, U, U, a URI is. If you actually stop and look at the, the, the acronym URI, which we often don't do, URI it stands for Universal Resource Identifier, right? So actually, we're identifying a resource. And another word for resource is just a thing. It's just a noun. It's any kind of object. The URI is just a string of characters to represent that object. And I'm going to use the word URL and URI interchangeably here because it's really not worth debating the difference. So here's an example of a URI, nice clean URI, uh, github.com. Um, it's just a website, a company, a service. That's what that URI represents. And then we have this concept of containment hierarchy. So when we have github.com slash joint, now we're talking about a user of this website. And also, this is pretty cool, too, because we're going further hierarchical. We're saying all the things that, that Joint owns and controls are inside the Joint namespace. So slash Joint slash node is a product inside there. We can make these things actually become more complicated as well. So in this case, we've got a slightly more complex thing, because this thing is actually a collection of other things um, so in this case, it's a, a stargazers, basically people who are watching uh, a particular project. Uh, 
So just like in JavaScript, you've got an array where you've got a single variable that's actually representing a whole collection of things. In this case, we've got a single URI that's representing a collection of other things, other resources. We can go even further. It can start to get a little bit uncool because we're starting to get these query strings and Q question marks. It just looks a little bit less clean, but it's for a practical reason. It's because with the search query, you could have all sorts of combinations and permutations. Um, so it's sort of separating it out from the core resource. So once you've got that in place, right, that, that's like the most important thing to take away from today about REST if you're not familiar with it. It's, it's just the fact that, that URLs actually represent actual things. Um, once you've got that in place, everything else, all, all the patterns start to fall out of, from there. So um, if you actually look at what happens when you click on a link, any link in your browser, or if you type a URL into your browser, this is actually what's going on. And you can open up DevTools or your favorite browser's equivalent, and you can actually see this sort of thing happening. You can actually see these calls take place. And this is how the browser interprets your desire to see that web page. So you can see here, um, we've got this connection happening, the request URL. Um, we've got a method. And with REST, we have methods. I'll get into it. So. Uh, in this case, we want to see it, so we use a get method to just say, show me that thing. And it comes back with a response code. It comes back and tells you, this is OK. So you can actually show the, the content here. You don't have to show an error message, for instance. How this looks at network level is something like this. Um, you have, you have a, basically a connection that's established from the browser to the server. I'm also, by the way, I'm talking about the browser, but this can also apply just as well to any client. It could apply to a mobile client. It could apply to a single page app that's made an Ajax call. You're, you've got, you set up this connection, and you're making a request. You're, you're identifying the thing that you want on the server, identifying the host that comes with it, and then there's a whole bunch of other metadata. So that's basically how packets look when you go back and forth on the web. Requests and response have just this whole set of headers on the way up to the server. And then on the way back down, we also have a bunch of headers. And each request and response can have an optional body. In this case, the request doesn't need any kind of body because it's just we're just saying, like, give me this thing. It's just a, a single string. But the body does, of course, because we're returning a response. So the body's saying, yep, that was good. Everything worked out. I found the data. I was able to render it. You're allowed to see it. And so it sends the actual body part. So uh, to put this in the context of why I'm explaining this, if you're writing your own RESTful service, you need to be aware of what these headers mean. And you need to be aware of the conventions of how you actually set these things up. So on the response side, how do we actually send this response if you are writing a REST API? Um, this is basically two possible responses. Uh, the most common one that everyone knows, it's like a household number now, is 404. It's basically indicating that you were looking for something that doesn't exist. It's not just an error. Um, there are other types of errors as well. 404 is a specific type of error saying, the thing that you were looking for wasn't found on the server. And 200, of course, is, is OK. That makes us happy. And that's what hopefully we're getting most of the time. This is the kind of way that you might actually write an API uh, or deal with, with a, a request that's coming in if you're doing it at a relatively low level. Um, you're basically going to look up the data, make sure everything's OK. And then you're going to come up with the right response. So in this case, we're saying, yep, if it was all right, we're going to send this secret and we're going to pass it as 200. But if the user, if the user isn't authorized to do this, um, then you're going to send a different status code. So it's up to you as the developer to know what's the appropriate status code. Because things downstream that will actually deal with this response are going to actually interpret it. And they're going to take advantage of it. So it's kind of important that you get that right. Um, Certainly, the browser is going to show the user potentially some message. And things along the way, caches and proxies that, and, and sorry if I say cache and cache, hopefully you guys know what I mean. Um, that the, I'll try to say cache, try to say it the right way, the Melbourne way. Um, so caches along the way are going to, to interpret these response codes. And if you, if you indicate in your response that this is cacheable, then, then the cache will actually hold it there. And, and it, will, it will look at these headers and it will, it'll do things according to them. 
And down here, you're actually dealing with this as a client. So you're, you're making this call with something like jQuery. You're going to be basically just saying, yep, once that's done and if it's all good, then this is what we'll, well, this is what we'll do with the response. If you're going, if it's an error, if there's a problem, then uh, you have to show uh, an error message. And this is a very simple high level example because we're not actually inspecting the actual headers. But that's because jQuery behind the scenes is doing that for us. So if you look in the guts of jQuery, you'll find a line like this that's exactly doing what I said. It's just looking at the numbers basically and saying, yep, on the web, anything from 200 to 300, it means it's all good. And, and that means it's going to be successful and it's going to cause your, your callback handler, your success callback handler to be called. But if you were writing something lower level, um, if you were writing your own, um, typically with mobile apps is one example, or command line apps, or in fact if you're writing a more complex single page app, you will probably have to look at those headers, header codes and actually uh, do something different depending on what the code that came back was. And there's a really cool uh, project called uh, HTTP status cats that uh, is the best way to learn all these response codes. Loads of examples. So we can see here in the, the 200 series of responses, while we always think of 200, there are actually other successful codes. And in, in one case here is just the fact that there's no content coming back, but everything went well. Um, with uh, 400, like I mentioned, 404 is not the only error that can happen. Uh, 403 is another relatively common example of an error where you don't have authori authorization to actually perform some action. So, so yes, the data might be there. Yes, the server might be willing to or might be able to, to uh, render it back to the user, but the user is not the right person to be looking at it. So we're just going to say like 403 and then the client can tell the user, sorry, you need to enter your password or sorry, you're not allowed. Just to show how these standards keep evolving and they're sort of just trying to make sense of what's already happening and what's going on in the world technologically and also in this case politically, Tim Bray has talked about this 451 standard that seems to be actually gaining momentum as he says here. So Tim Bray proposed this 451 standard that's effectively a kind of uh, standards say that, that this content's being blocked by a provider or a, a government could be blocking the content. So it means that, yes, the server might be willing to show it, but someone in the middle is saying, no, you can't actually see it. Um, so just you know, loads of different types of error codes. And really, the whole point of, of REST, and REST is really just a bunch of principles and patterns for how you design these conventions, uh, or pr principle and patterns and conventions, really, for how you design RESTful services. And so when we think about the whole internet, there's lots of things happening on the internet. There's lots of possible errors when you look across all of the possible servers and applications that are using the internet. And that's why you do need fairly broad coverage. So it's pretty cool that we've actually got a standard to cover all of these possible scenarios that could happen fairly closely. Another point about responses beyond the response code is what do you actually send back? And if you're writing an API, there is this argument that you should be sending back self-documenting responses. So instead of sending back, uh, so I'll, I'll read it actually. So it says URL, previous, next, owner, and they've all got their own, uh, their own separate URLs uh, as the values for that. So instead of saying owner, example.com slash people slash sue, a simple way to do this would be just to say owner sue or owner 47, just some ID. It's more common in APIs to do it that way, to just send numeric IDs. And, and this is really a bit of a debate about whether you should be doing it this way or that. There's no right answer. I think this, this technique, it's called hate OS, it's a really bad acronym. Um, I think it is actually starting to gain some momentum if you look around on the prominent blogs in this area. But it's by no means a certainty that you should be using it. Because what it really does is it makes it easier for the developer, right? It makes it easier so that you can actually navigate to the next call. Um, there are sort of attempts to make it so that machines can interpret this stuff and machines can automatically work out where to go. You, know, you don't have to worry. It's like kind of like how people used to do things with Wisdle and Soap. I'm a, I'm a lot more skeptical about that way. I think developers still need to be in the loop when it comes to actually interpreting results and actually writing code specifically to deal with it. But 
you can see the advantage. It, it does make your APIs more self-documenting. And on the other hand, it means for maybe the, the 15 or 20 minutes the developer saves from having to construct the URL themselves, the trade-off is you're going to have billions of calls going with, with extra strings, albeit somewhat compressed. So as well as the actual response, uh, the, the body that comes back, we've got to think about uh, what sort of type, um, what sort of view basically will come back in, what we call a content type. There's, um, there's this notion that you can actually send, uh, or, or in the request, you can send a request for a particular type of view. So here we're, we've got a thing called slash places slash Melbourne. And there's lots of different ways we could represent Melbourne, right? Um, we could get an image representation of Melbourne. Give me an image representing Melbourne. And going further than that, we could say, give me an image in JPEG format. Give me an image in PNG format. Similarly, we could ask for audio. We could ask for text. And in this case, we're asking for HTML. So this is typically what would happen in a browser. You could potentially also use it in your own application to get a bit of HTML about Melbourne. So, so this is this request coming in. And then the server is going to interpret that and say, OK, I see they want HTML. So that's what we give them. We give them, uh, we explain the content type that we've put out. And we, we actually output the HTML. In another situation, you might, want, you might be doing something more programmatically, and this is really, really common these days, is to accept application JSON instead, and then the server sends you out a nice bit of data structure that you, your program can take advantage of. And it gets a bit more complicated too. There's, there's sort of processes of negotiation where you can give it several, and the server will sort of come up with the, the best one that it can do if it can't do your first choice. It's also common to have this kind of slightly cheating notation. I think most of us have seen this where you just append a .json on the URL uh, or you append something like format equals JSON. That's technically, purists don't like this idea because it's, it's, the, the, it's making the URI something different. Purists like the idea that, um, that a URI represents a thing and it's always the same thing no matter how you're actually uh, viewing it, how you're actually sending down the response. Um, but I think in practical terms, it's really nice, it's really convenient because a great thing about REST is that we can test so much of this just in our browser or just by making simple uh, calls on the command line using curl or whatever. So it's so nice to be able to just type curl URL and that's all you have to worry about. There's so far, really, all I've talked about is, is reading, right? I've only talked about how we actually get content. And as you can see, there's a reasonable amount of things to know about that with REST. But let's think about how you might change things on the server as well, because of course, that's what we want to do too. We want to be able to go out to the world and, and uh, create tweets and put images on Flickr and post on Reddit. So REST handles all of those things, again, in a fairly generic way. It says, OK, there's this thing there. We've identified this URI scheme. So we already got, we know how to talk about this thing. Now, instead of getting it and, and pulling it down from the server, we're going to actually change it. And so it's all pretty basic. It's all pretty simple rules for this. So in this case, we're putting it, right? So now we're going we're to send the body in, and we're going to put this thing, and, and that's going to change what it is like on the server. And same, we can create and read and update and delete all the sort of usual database actions that we call CRUD. Um, putting is basically where we actually send the data to the right place. Um, delete is something where it's pretty intuitive. You're just leaving the thing at that, you're, you're th at that place, at that, at that um, location, or identified by that URL. And post is a little bit more complicated, because with post, we don't really know where it's going to go. We're just sending a new object, a new thing up to the server, and it's up to the server to tell us where it put it in the response. Um, put can be actually both a creation and an update. That's how the convention really works, because um, typically with put, you may not know whether this thing already exists. So it's kind of like, you know, update it if it's already there. Otherwise, just create a new one and put it there. And of course, whether, you're, whether or not the server will let you create it, that's a separate question. That depends on, on uh, the security aspects we'll talk about in a minute. Oops. So a minute has come pretty quick, because now it's time to talk about security. 
So now that we've got our URI, URI scheme in place uh, and we've got a basic um, set of conventions, we know how we can change data and view it on the server, the next step is really to make sure that the, the, the people who are allowed to see things are the ones who actually see it. And you know, this can be, with security, it can be fairly simple or it can be quite complex. Um, you know, in the simplest case, everything's public and read-only and we don't have to worry too much about locking everything down. In more complicated cases, of course, you know, with things like our email or our direct messages on Twitter, only one person can see that, right? We can only see our own email, for instance. In other cases, it could be everyone inside the company can see everything. Everyone outside the company can't see anything and can, lots of shades of gray in the middle. So with REST, sort of the first step is really to, to consider that REST treats security fairly orthogonally. So you don't really need to have um, URLs representing uh, who can actually see this content. Like you don't say question mark view for someone or whatever inside your URL. You can kind of design your, your REST scheme without having to worry about that in the first instance. And the first principle that really has to be in place for any kind of secure API is just SSL or HTTPS, um, making sure that this connection is locked down. And these days on the web in general, uh, in terms of public websites, but also in terms of APIs, I think everything is going SSL. I, I actually have this theory that Google in a couple of years will start actually giving people slight bumps on their SEO for if, it's, if it's an SSL site because uh, the same way they did that with performance a few years ago. Because it's, it's just a tremendously important thing for, for, for the integrity of, of when you go and visit a site or when you use a URL. Uh, the web's become a lot more dangerous place. There's a lot more hacking going on and also um, SSL has actually become a lot cheaper now as well. So on the flip side, it's actually a lot easier to do this. Um, and uh, another, um, well, another reason to do this, um, even if it's a public site, something like Wikipedia, even Wikipedia will increasingly move to, a prob I, I guess, you know, SSL only at some point because basically, it, it, well, it, one thing it, it ensures the privacy of the user. It means that intermediary points can't actually see which URLs the user's accessing. Um, it ensures the, the login authentication secure, and it also ensures, um, probably most importantly, that no one can inject new content and that you're actually seeing the content that Wikipedia, this is actually real Wikipedia. It's not someone's um, middleman injected version of Wikipedia. And there was some ho posts recently on Hacker News about Apple having, having uh, ads, like, you know, someone just walked into their hotel room and they had ads showing up on the Apple homepage. So you can see how someone like Apple is going to be turning around pretty quick and, and starting to make sure that all the pages are SSL to avoid that. Oh, oh sorry about the screen's gone a bit funny with the size. Um, so in terms of actually making sure the user is who they say they is, the simplest mechanism is just HTTP basic auth. It's just like passing a user and password in every single request. And this has had quite a bad rap over the years. Um, and the main reason for that is that you've got the password sitting there in plain text in every request. Anyone who intercepts those requests can see the password. I think this is actually starting to make a comeback because if you are locking down the whole connection, then even though this is a very simple approach, it can actually be very secure. The thing to worry about is that you do actually accept only SSL. If you're accepting plain text as well as SSL, then there's the risk that the user might actually send uh, the password in plain text or the developer might send it in plain text. I heard a podcast, uh, there's a good podcast on this whole area actually called um, Traffic and Weather. And the latest episode, they were talking about this and there was a recent blog post about this topic. And basically, um, they, they're quite favorable of it, but they made the point that it's a good practice to even uh, maybe even uh, delete the password, right? So as soon as you get a single uh, request that comes in that's in plain text sending the password as part of an API call, then you just say, sorry, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna deal with that. You're not getting a response and I've just changed your password. So you're not gonna be sending that again. Make sure you send over SSL. Uh, and so if you follow those kinds of practices and also maybe it's important to ensure that the, this isn't being logged in the wrong place because if this goes inside a company and it goes through all the labyrinth of the whole company network, then it might also get logged in the wrong place. You know, this actually might be the pattern that we all end up using. 
Request signing um, was kind of the antidote to that. So instead of actually sending the password, we do some magic mathematical checksum hash formula that's based on the URL. On, and so we make some calculation here that no one could possibly guess uh, randomly. And then the server on the other side verifies that only someone who had the password would, would have been able to make that, create that signature correctly. And so it verifies it. And so you can actually send that over plain text. And Amazon's a big fan of this with some of their services. But like I say, I think it's probably more complex than it maybe needs to be now. You can also do things like sessions or, or uh, session cookies or just generally tokens um, that get exchanged. So the first time, um, you've just got that one request that sends for the password, or well, sends the password the first time. It, the server then comes back with a token. And then you start sending that token back and forth. And that way, you're not sending the password across every time. But it's a little bit like, what's the real point? I mean, you're already sending the password. It's only once, but you're still sending it in plain text. And so it doesn't necessarily have the advantage um, of, of just sending every time, but making sure that it's actually locked down. And in this whole area, I have to mention OAuth and OAuth 2. That's really for doing something a little bit more complex. Because with all of these previous examples, it was just a case of the server's got something. I'm writing a client to get hold of it, so I just go back and forth. With OAuth, it's a standard for dealing with really two services and a user. And it's basically the user saying, I want this service to be able to get hold of this service's data. And so the user has to make this kind of permission thing happen. And you all know the Twitter dance that you go through. Um, OAuth is, again, a little bit more complex than it would be ideal. OAuth 2 um, requires SSL. So there's that trend again. And it makes things simpler. But it's still something where, unfortunately, you have to use a library. You can't just mess around with your browser and dev tools and, and curl. You have to actually do some coding to, to make the calls happen. So the final step really is to talk about what I'm calling turbo mode, um, making sure that things are fast. And that's what keeps users happy. When I talk about raw performance, that's basically like you know, if I'm tapping something right now, like tapping this slide controller, how fast? How fast is it going to make me to be happy? Um, how fast is it going to help to respond quickly for my needs? Um, and as you just saw, this little preview, this is really more about perceived performance than anything else. You know, when you, whenever you hear about performance, you should always be thinking about the end goal, which is almost always to make the user happy and, and make them feel responsive. And some of you might be aware of some of the tricks that Apple put into iOS, um, especially with the first iPhone that wasn't as powerful as it is today. Things like you know, when you rotate the screen, it would have this kind of cool transition. Um, and you know, it makes it kind of fun and everything, but it was also a way of masking the processing that was going on. So it was really managing the user's perception, even though the actual underlying performance might have been a lot slower. The other aspect is scalability, right? So how many uh, requests can you handle coming in? Can you handle this onslaught of requests when your site's posted to Hacker News or, uh, or Reddit? And uh, to put it in more technical terms, it's really the, the performance, what I'm considering here, is really about you know, what's the time or the perceived time it takes for a request to, to go back and forth so the user feels like the computer's actually done what they, they asked it to do. And scalability is more about how many people can we handle at the same time using our site or our service. The relationship between the two is mainly from the fact that if you're performing faster, right? if, you're, if you're able to fob requests off really quickly, then you can actually handle more people because your server is going to be less clogged. You've got more throughput. So if you improve scalability, you also, or if you improve performance, you also improve scalability. And what REST has to say about this is, is with caching. Um, there's, there's loads of web performance techniques around. And a lot of them are Steve Suter's type things like, um, like minifying JavaScript and putting JavaScript tags down the bottom. That's all important, but that's sort of slightly separate. What REST is doing, it's doing it at a slightly different uh, level of abstraction, more on the network level. So you guys know the principle of a, a cache. Um, it's basically just, you know, we have this cache. It's going to be, you've got this local browser cache here. 
and you pull the image down or, or some content down, and then you keep it inside the browser. And so the next time the user goes and looks at the same page, hopefully all of it, or at least most of it, you can actually fetch locally. And so there's that notion of perceived performance. We're not worried about, um, or the user doesn't really care about where it really came from. The user just wants to know that they've got something that's up to date, that's true with whatever else that anyone else would see in the rest of the world. And we do that by actually keeping as much as we can locally and serving it from there. So really, the best network call is the one that you don't have to make. If you can have as much caching as possible, um, then you don't have to even think about you know, how fast, how, how slow, how long is your network call going to be. I like to think about caching as that we have to be sort of opportunistic. It's a little bit like the security principle of defense in depth. You can't just catch things with, with one uh, particular technique. You have to be able to see you know, all the opportunities for caching throughout that whole request response cycle. So in, in a simple case, oh, maybe I can reduce this. There we go. So in the simplest case, you know, imagine we've got a web page, and this applies to APIs. I'll talk about the API scenario in a sec. We're pulling down some content. How are we going to say uh, what stuff actually gets cached? The browser's doing the caching, but it's actually the server that's giving some suggestions about, yeah, maybe this would be a good thing to cache. Maybe this would be a good thing to, to actually just ignore so that the next time um, the user gets a fresh version of it. Um, so we have you know, cache control no cache, meaning um, don't cache it. Um, don't actually send, don't actually show the, the user the response next time. Just serve it once, and that's the last time the user's going to see this thing. We've got cache control max age, um, which actually is for setting how many seconds this thing is valid for. Uh, in this case, it's a year, so it's basically sort of like forever. We're saying this thing never changes. I'm pretty sure that it's going to be the same today as it is tomorrow as it is in a year's time. And what I'm showing you here is actually quite a good pattern for doing this with your web pages. Some frameworks give you this for free. If you're using something like Rails with its asset pipeline these days, um, it does a lot of this for you. So uh, we talked about magic the other night at Melbourne JS. Depending on how comfortable you are with magic, you might actually be getting a lot of this for free anyway. Um, but it's, even so, it's still important to know about it because you're going to run into issues. You're going to run into stale caching issues where you're serving users old content and things like that. You, you need to know about it, and you might also need to know about it to improve your development experience when you're working locally. Um, so the pattern here is basically that we serve one thing fresh, right? So this top level, this HTML that includes the latest content and also includes the, all the other assets, you know, the CSS, JavaScript, all our images. The actual HTML that points to all of those things, we serve that fresh every time. We make sure that the user gets the very latest version. But these other things, which is probably the majority of the actual bytes that get downloaded, these other things we actually keep locally, right? We cache them. And we cache them for a very long time. And the way we can guarantee that happens, so really I'm showing you a kind of uh, pattern, a useful tip here on how you can actually structure your uh, APIs or pages. The way that we make sure that we can cache this for a really long time is we change it. We change the URL every time we change the actual content. So we have this contract, this kind of guarantee, um, this operating procedure inside our companies that every time you change the CSS, you make some pink border blue, doesn't matter how small the change is, you rev the version. You, know, you might make it, you might have a, a, just a version number concept, like you know, make it version v3, and then you rename it to v4. Or if you want to get some funky automated procedure going, and you don't have to worry about collisions between two different people adding it at the same time, you might use just some sort of GUID scheme that auto-generates the version. It doesn't really matter. As long as you can guarantee that there will never again in the, the history and future of your service send something with this, with this URL that is not actually this content. Because once you send that down with that infinite cache, that's going to be cached potentially all across the internet. right? Like, you know, Telstra might cache it for all of Australia. Your company might cache it as it leaves your company's network. Someone else's company, when it comes into their network, might cache it, and the browser might cache it. And they're all entitled to cache it forever. So 
So even if you change it in six months, if someone hasn't really used the, that browser very much in the past six months, they're still going to get um, that. They're still going to get the old version, and that's why you, you know keep the URLs for all these things separate, but uh, but rev rev them every time that they actually change. You can apply the same principle to APIs. And this is kind of interesting. I should give the caveat that this is a little bit beta because actually something I'm using in Player FM, it seems to be working actually really well. But it's kind of funny that I've actually put a post up on, on a programmer Stack Exchange to try to get some feedback and a few other places. I haven't had anyone say what's wrong with it, but I just am not aware of any APIs that are actually doing it. Um, so it comes with that caveat that you might want to treat it as experimental. But I think it's, it can be very powerful. And the idea is it's the same kind of thing that when you make a, a request for some sort of top level object, uh, in this case we're searching for, for topics that the users subscribe to, we're just going to get back a very small anemic list, a little skeleton of the things that they're actually interested in. We're not getting back their entire timeline of all the actual episodes that have come back. Um, and that thing then lets us get these other things that are inside it, these children, these nested resources that are actually the topics themselves. And the cool thing about these topics is they cache really well because um, they, are, you know, they are topics that, that are time stamped. Um, in this case, uh, I'm using a, a GUID, but they could be time stamped or whatever. As long as they, they keep going, keep changing every time. Um, every time there's a new episode, this resource will update, and then after that, it just won't update until there's a new episode. So it could be the same for a month, and so we can cache it for a really long time, um, because if it ever does update, the actual URL in here, the top level API, will redirect us to that new one. So yeah, that can that old one can sit around on all these caches for ages until it becomes um, something that no one's touched for a while, so it just gets purged automatically by the cache. So we don't really care about the fact that these old things are sitting in there because we're never referencing them. We're always getting fresh content for the top level and, and fetching it from that. Um, very briefly, I'll mention that there is a standard for conditional caching too. So here I talked about how we get this content, this top level data every time fresh. In fact, the web's a little bit smarter than that. You can actually make sure that, that, that all those, those bytes don't go down every time, because it would be a fair expense. You know, you, you're still probably in an API. You might be retrieving this once an hour or once a day to get the latest content. You probably want to avoid uh, sending those bytes down if they're not changing. Uh, a good example of this is some sort of emergency warning system. If you have something like that, it's very rare that an emergency warning system changes, right? Like if it's going to say, um, the risk of a fire right now is low, then probably an hour later it's also going to say the risk of a fire is low. But if it does change, you want to know straight away. You don't want that to be cached for four hours. It says like the risk of fire is low to everyone for the next four hours. You want them to be getting the, the latest data every time. So the way you do that is with conditional caching. You say, I've actually got the version and from an hour ago, right? So you gave me this version. I've got a version number I can tell you about or a timestamp. It works both ways. I've got that, so can you give me this, but only give it to me if it's actually changed. Otherwise, don't bother. And the server looks at it and says, oh, yeah, that's still the same latest version. So just you know, 304 code back, and then the client knows, yep, it was a 304, so we don't have to actually change that. So it's all good. And then you're sending, you, you are having to still make the request, but you're not having to do much work. You're not having to send the bytes down. And if you set things up the right way, you're actually not having to do much work on your server either. Um, again, this is where some servers provide you with some magic. So I know with Rails, for instance, it will actually make sure uh, that the actual response that comes out, it will, keep hold, it, will, it will keep them on the server so the next time the user asks for, the, for that URL, if, if the last time it sent out the same thing, um, then it will return a 304. It won't even bother sending out the whole thing because it knows the users or the clients already got that. Um, and there's differing degrees of magic. You know, things like Apache and Nginx can also do this kind of thing reasonably well as well. Um, but as if you're writing a, as an API and you're writing something dynamically, you can take that a lot further because in that scenario, if you're relying on the magic of something like Apache, 
you're still having to actually generate the response every time. You're still having to do the work of, of generating this you know, entire front page of Reddit or something. And it's only after it gets pushed down a stream a little bit within your own network that something like Apache will look at that and say, oh, you already sent that to the user, so we'll just send back a 304. Um, if you're doing it a smarter way, you can use timestamps. You can maybe just look up a single object and say, oh, it hasn't changed since the last time. Or maybe if you write things statically as static files. So, so you can actually, you know, this is kind of the advantage of, of understanding REST reasonably well and understanding how all these protocols interplay. Um, you can be a lot smarter than just what your frameworks are providing. And really the final principle I want to talk about today is that there's also this notion of, of caching on the edge. We have all these intermediaries and this is a big selling point of REST is that everyone agrees on this standard whether they're a server or a browser or all of these caches in the middle. And I already alluded to this. I said that, that Telstra, ISPs, you know, they have their own caches. Companies have their own caches. So there's caching happening at, at, every, at every level. And we can potentially take advantage of this. So the sort of thing we, we want to be able to end up with is that the caching happens at multiple levels. And so we want it so that when a request happens here, the first thing it does, it just looks locally, right? It just looks on, on its, its own system to see if it's already cached there. Uh, and so this is this idea of being opportunistic, like at every step of the way in this whole request response cycle, we want to sort of cut the whole thing short and say, nope, we've already got it. We don't need to take it up to the next level. Um, then we might have, as I said, you know, we might have someone's company might have a cache and then the ISP might have a cache and, and so on. And what you can actually do if you're running these services yourself is you can actually, um, you can set these things up. So uh, for my service, I use Cloudflare. There are other companies that provide these services and, and they actually act as this intermediary for you, for you. and they actually uh, have all these different platforms in place that are close to users um, across the world basically so that the, if it is cached, not only do you get the benefit of it not sending the, con the request back to your server and clogging up your server resources and, and that extra speed, you don't just get that benefit, but you also get the fact that it's coming straight from close to the user. Uh, those are some of the services uh, you know, that do this sort of thing. So really, um, my, my last point is really to say, like, why should you be using REST? Um, and Hopefully I've made it clear that, that REST is already what you are using. You, you, you may or may not know it, but all of these, these things that you're, you're dealing with, requests and response and AJAX and, and JavaScript and servers and browsers, you know, they're all taking great advantage of it already. So it's really just understanding the ecosystem that you're already working with, no matter what kind of programming you're doing these days. Like I said, you know, even if you're doing native uh, Android programming or you're writing embedded systems, you're still on the client side of, of many RESTful calls, most likely. It's also, uh, you know, beyond the kind of efficiency argument, it's just a very familiar thing that anyone else can come along into your project and they can be familiar with how you've set things up. If you're creating an API, you're going to be more attractive to developers if you design according to these patterns because developers are familiar with these patterns. You're not having to uh, come up with some weird little idiosyncratic um, set of URLs that are you know, following your own ideas and beliefs. Um, it's, it's just something that developers can pick up. And I, I found that with Google Glass when they launched the Mirror API, it was really easy, even though I hadn't had any access to, to Glass at all, haven't seen it, haven't touched it, but I could very quickly understand um, browsing the API docs how it worked just because they followed the conventions. And the final point is that really this is about just having less of these so-called bike shedding arguments, these arguments over trivial features that don't really make a lot of difference. If you're arguing about how to send responses, like we do this with, with programming, we argue about whether we should be, you know, if there's an error, should we return false, should we throw an exception, should we return nil? It doesn't really matter. What matters much more is that everyone agrees on the same convention. That's what makes us, you know, the, the, the small differences are like, you know, one percenters, maybe one thing's, you know, one percent better than the other. 
the big differences are like you know a thousand percent more efficient if you're already working with the tools and the the conventions that people are familiar with so less reinventing the wheel and more actually making things that users and developers care about so i think that's about it